watching CNBC TV 18. It is the most coveted job in the corporate world, but in times of uncertainty, it's also a grueling, solitary and challenging one. I'm talking about the CEO of today and this is the second episode of The Winning Mindset, the CEO guidebook. It's a good CEO from a great CEO. CNBC TV 18, in partnership with McKinsey, has arrived at a definitive list of India's top CEOs. What were the ground rules? Well, the CEO must have completed at least five years in office. The total return to shareholders must be higher than rivals in the industry, delivering on the goals that they set out for the company. And we also applied a few criteria in the interest of diversity to choose from public sector companies and women executives. And the first CEO to make our short list is... <laughs> took over as the MD of Tata Steel in 2013 when the company was in danger of a collapse. Today, Tata Steel is the most profitable company in the Tata Group. In FI22, it reported a profit of over 40,000 crore rupees, which is more than the 38,000 crore rupees reported by TCS. Now, during Narendran's tenure as CEO, the total return to shareholders has grown by more than 140%. It is the 10th largest steel producer in the world and counts itself as one of the elite companies to make it to the Fortune 500 list. For Narendran, the Tata Steel love affair began three decades ago when the company's legendary leader, Rusi Modi, recruited him from the IM Calcutta campus. Tata Steel was a very uh, well-known uh, company, obviously one of the best in India even then. And uh, Mr. Rusi Modi had this larger-than-life uh, persona. I remember him coming to I'm Calcutta, where I was studying for the pre-placement talks. And I think the Tata Steel pre-placement talk arguably was the most impressive. You know, they used to take over the whole mess uh, for the uh, audiovisual. Mr. Modi used to come in a very flowery Hawaiian shirt, unlike most other CEOs. So, you know, you got a sense that this company is larger than life and should be a fun place to work in. So. Uh, you know, despite all uh, all the logic which goes into your lives before that, when you sometimes choose uh, companies to work for, at least at that age, uh, you know, you would go by some of the more, I dare say, superficial stuff. Having spent his entire career at Tata Steel, Narendran is the quintessential one company man who has a real emotional connect with his workplace. I don't know if you know, but in Jamshedpur, we even have sixth generation workers you know, people who worked in the company for six generations. So the emotional connect between the employees and the organization is very high. So that's uh, both good and bad in some sense, but uh, you know, it puts tremendous pressure on leadership because you know that you're running with a legacy and you need to take it forward. When Narendran took charge as the managing director of Tata Steel in 2012, the company was in danger of sinking under the weight of its own ambitions. In FI13, it reported a loss of more than 7,000 crore rupees. The return on equity was a negative 18.4%. So in 2013, uh, when I took over, uh, we were actually going through a very, very challenging time. Uh, you know, the MMDR Act was coming in. Uh, there were Supreme Court judgments uh, on uh, the mining activity that we did and that everyone else did. And a few months after I took over, all our mines were closed. Now, Tata Steel, for over a hundred years, has always mined its own iron ore and got its own iron ore from its mines. And suddenly we had to deal with a situation where a critical raw material had to be imported. And uh, you know, so that was a hugely challenging task because our logistics, our supply chains were not geared up for it. We didn't want to lose production. So we went through a very challenging time. Then on the next year after that, we had dumping of steel from China. So one after the other, we had a very few tough years soon after I took over. And I think uh, I look at a crisis always as an opportunity because uh, that kind of focuses everyone on the need to change and to uh, keep uh, reinventing oneself. 
In 2001, Tata Steel had a single plant in Jamshedpur. It was ranked 55 among global steel companies. It was not a force to be reckoned with. But under the leadership of B. Muthuraman, Tata Steel embarked on a massive expansion spree. By 2013, it had steel plants spread across Southeast Asia, Europe and the United Kingdom. Now, the purchase of Chorus, a $13 billion acquisition in the UK, turned into a millstone around the neck of whoever came next to lead the company. We are here at Port Talbot and that's the Tata Steel plant right here. I've been in contact with potential buyers, making clear that the government stands ready to help. Leave alone Port Talbot and give us the rest. That's not a solution acceptable. The government policy on steel under review changes on the cards, but they will come too late for Tata. In London, Sanjay Suri. We must also uh, appreciate the context in which we went global. You know. Tata Steel in 2003, 4, 5 during that period and I used to be very closely working with the then CEO Mr. Muthraman. So scale was very important and while we tried very hard to grow in India, there were not too many inorganic opportunities in India at that point in time and we signed MOUs with different state governments but the process of acquiring land, starting a steel plant uh, was much slower than we had thought. And there was only that much we could do in Jamshedpur because it's a steel plant in the middle of a city. Scaling up was very important in that decade and that's why we went global. But having said that, the 2008-2009 crisis obviously uh, turned a few things on its head, right? So to that extent, we had to relook at our uh, scaling up strategy in the context of the post-2008 uh, financial crisis. And that's when you looked at the portfolio of assets. Our structurally weakest asset was the UK, where we had 10 million tons of steel production. So over a period of time, a lot of uh, uh, heavy lifting was done uh, in the UK and we shrunk that business from 10 million tons to what it is today, it's a 3 million ton business. Narendra was also trying to breathe life into Tata Steel's legacy and not just rest on it. I have quoted uh, one of the academics from the US, uh, Professor Vijay Govindrajan, uh, who once said that a company which only talks of its past has no future. And uh, I think uh, Tata Steel, uh, sometimes uh, we used to talk a bit more of the past than we needed to, uh, or rather we were proud of our past, but were we talking enough about the future? Were we thinking enough about the future? Were we, uh, you know, kind of indulging ourselves more than required in the past? I mean, the past was something done wonderfully well by many of our predecessors. So what are we doing which creates a great past for our subsequent generations? So I think uh, uh, this kind of uh, work takes time. You keep talking about it at the different forums and it gets embedded into the way the organization uh, thinks about itself, the way the leaders think about what they need to do. And that's how culture change is driven. While success does not happen in an instant for Narendra, it was a long, hard graph to make sure that the company was purring again. Tata Steel largely reported losses from FY13 to FY17, but things started to turn around from FY18, and to achieve this, the company curtailed its overseas ambitions and turned to India to build scale. In India, we had everything. We had the raw materials, we had a growing market, we had uh, a lot of... Uh, uh, experience in working in uh, the states which had all the raw materials. So that's when uh, for us uh, growth in India became an obvious choice by which time the Kalinganagar project which had got stalled for a few years because of the problems that we had got started. The Kalinganagar steel plant in Orissa was stalled for more than a decade due to protests by locals who opposed the acquisition of tribal land. In 2006, violence broke out in Kalinganagar and 13 protesters were killed in police firing, including one policeman. Now, years later, an inquiry commission exonerated both the police and the administration. So the focus was to complete the Kalinganagar project, which we did by 2015. And uh, we had enough land in Kalinganagar to really grow from the 3 million tons that we had today to about 16 million tons. So we are moving from 3 million to 8 million there. In the meanwhile, Jamshedpur had also grown. We had grown it to 7 million tons and then to 10 million tons. But today, 
uh, when we pursued the inorganic growth opportunities because in the last four or five years, those opportunities came away thanks to the IBC. IBC, the Insolvency and Bankruptcy Code, came into force in 2016. Highly leveraged stressed assets were taking a toll on India's financial system and the economy. Now, this law provided a new lease of life to save a business as a going concern through restructuring the debt and changing the ownership. And Tata Steel could smell an opportunity and went on a shopping spree. In 2018, Tata Steel bought Bhushan Steel through the IBC process for a little over 35,000 crore rupees. Usha Martin was next, a 4,500 crore rupee acquisition that Tata Steel did in 2019. And in 2022, it acquired Neela Cholispath for about 12,000 crore rupees. We were the first uh, off the block with uh, Bhushan and we had done diligence on all the assets. We saw that that was a great asset and we were too willing to bid aggressively for it, which we did, got it. And uh, within two years turned it around. And we've done similarly in Nilachal, within three months of acquiring an asset which has been closed for more than two years, uh, we've started production this month. So within three months of acquiring the asset, we started production. So I think we have the ability to turn difficult assets around, get the most out of it. We have a very uh, well integrated value chain uh, from iron ore mining to coal mining to very value added products. And the Indian market is growing and uh, uh, you know, India has a long way to grow. And over the last few years, the focus on infrastructure is really going to uh, increase the steel intensity of growth for India. So I think why would we not seize the opportunities that there were in India, which was structurally a better place to produce steel than most of the other countries that we were in. And we had great assets uh, uh, with us. And today, with the assets that we have in our portfolio in India, between Bhushan's plant, which is in Miramandli or Angul, uh, the Nilachal plant in Kalinganagar, our own plant in Kalinganagar, and Jamshedpur, we can expand to 40, 45 tons. While the stock markets waved a thumbs up to the acquisition of Bhushan and Usha Martin, the purchase of Nilachal is path at over 12,000 crore rupees did raise a few eyebrows. So if you look at Nilachal as a 1 million ton steel plant for which Tata Steel has paid 12,000 crores, obviously uh, it looks very expensive. But uh, you know, we didn't pay 12,000 crores for a 1 million ton plant. We bought the Usha Martin plant for 4,000 crores. That's 1 million tons, right? The reason why we paid 12,000 crores is Nilachal is sitting on a 2,500 acre plot of land. You can make 10 million tons there. And we know how difficult it is to acquire 2,500 acres in India, right? And this is next to our Kalinganagar site. It's just across the road. So together we have 6,000 acres of land now in Kalinganagar, which means we can grow that site to 25 million tons, right? That's extremely valuable. Because you cannot create a 25 million ton steel plant in India anywhere so easily, right? And if you look at it globally, steel plants who are most competitive are ones which have a scale in that, in that range, 15 to 25 million tons. Uh, we shouldn't have a collection of 5 million or 10 million ton plants. We need to have fewer sites which are at this size, then you can uh, leverage the scale. With new acquisitions in the bag, Narendran had the task of integrating them into the Tata Steel family. That and more coming up after this short break on the winnings mindset, the CEO guidebook. Welcome back. You're watching The Winning Mindset, the CEO guidebook. And today we're bringing you the story of Tata Steel's revival under TV Narendran. Now, when Narendran took over, Tata Steel had an overall capacity to produce less than 7 million tons per annum at its Jamshedpur plant. Today, after several acquisitions and brownfield expansion, the total capacity stands at 34 million tons per annum. A lot of it is thanks to successful integration of assets that were acquired. We are very careful about the people uh, that we uh, uh, resource these assets with. We want to find a good blend of people who can go from Tata Steel, be good ambassadors of Tata Steel, be good leaders there. Because not, it's, you can't just send uh, busloads of people from Tata Steel. You'll send a few, but a vast majority of the people who you need to work with are the people who've been in those organizations uh, before you went there. right? So there is a culture change you need to drive there but it is better to do it with them than without them. So how do you make sure that they get invested in the way you want to work? How do you excite them 
to do things uh, differently and how do you take them along and I think so you need to send very mature leadership to these organizations who can not only work uh, with the Tata Steel people but also work with the teams who were there locally before we went in. We also make sure that there's enough support provided by all parts of Tata Steel. Uh, we look at collaboration as a very important part of uh, leadership qualities. So you cannot have a situation where somebody from one site doesn't support somebody from another site. We don't look kindly at people who don't want to move from one side to another or bosses who don't want to release people to move from one side to another. So, so there is the whole organization galvanizes itself around this and it's taken as a collective job. You may have a local CEO and a local leadership but everyone takes it on as their responsibility because it's Tata Steel's reputation which is at stake. So I think uh, it's a very strong part of a culture and which is, uh, so the softer elements are very strong. Well, another feather in Narendran's cap is the way that he's cut down the company's debt. Tata Steel was saddled with a net debt of more than 1 lakh crore rupees. Soon after the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic, Tata Steel embarked on a mission and reduced its debt by nearly 50,000 crore rupees in seven quarters. And even as it was tightening its belt, Tata Steel continued to pay dividends to shareholders and announced a stock split as well. Tata Steel has always been a very cost-focused company. Okay, uh, if you go to any of our operating sites, we really look at costs at a great level of detail. We've also been a very EBITDA-focused company. Okay. Uh, but I think what we probably didn't focus enough on was on cash. And I think that's uh, been a big shift uh, which uh, uh, Chandra brought in as, once he took over as a chairman. Uh, so which also helped us focus more on the cash flows, more on the debt that we need to reduce. Because obviously because of all the challenges that we've had, uh, our debt had started going up. It had uh, we, uh, it was at around 65,000, 68,000 crores when we acquired Bhushan. So it became about 103, 104,000 crores, right? So that was when COVID hit us, right? Uh, and that's when we said, or actually the year before COVID itself, we had said that we need to reduce our debt by at least a billion dollars a year. Okay, so we said, let's bring down the debt. At that time, if I remember right, uh, net debt to EBITDA was uh, around four to five, you know, in that range. Some in a in a bad quarter, it went up to over five, maybe even six. And we had said that we should at least get it to below two, right? Uh, so we said, let's get uh, the net debt to EBITDA down to two. Let's uh, look at deleveraging at least a billion dollars a year. And we started doing that. Second thing which was done is in Europe, we did away with the level which was Tata Steel Europe. We split the businesses into Tata Steel Netherlands and Tata Steel UK. So in some sense, Tata Steel today is being run as one company with five sites. Uh, three in India and two in uh, Europe. In fact, now six in India, uh, four in India because of Nilachal. Uh, uh, so a lot of corporate overheads uh, have been removed and there's a much sharper focus on the operational performance and each of the sites, particularly the European sites, are being told you have to take care of yourself, right? So, uh, so there's sharper focus there. Like I said, the Dutch site is strong enough to take care of itself. UK site is more fragile. Uh, so there is a struggle there in difficult times. Just now in Europe, the big struggle is energy costs. But the teams are focused. They know that fundamentally they have to take care of their own cash flows. Uh, India can take care of the cash flows that is required for growth. And Europe should take care of the cash flows that it requires for them to sustain. A successful company does not rely on a single leader. It also needs to be more than just the sum of its parts. And Narendran is well aware of this as he hopes to drive leadership at all levels. I keep telling my colleagues, our union leaders, for instance, the difference between them and us is uh, they are all elected. We are all selected. And that makes a big difference uh, on how you drive leadership. So how can you respect them for that? And how can you make sure that there are enough leaders on the shop floor? Who can drive the change that you want to drive? We took a leadership uh, team of the unions through the sustainability training from Cambridge Institute. You know, we got the Cambridge uh, uh, Sustainability Institute people and uh, did training for our board members, did training for the top 300 leaders of Tata Steel and did training for the leaders of the, uh, our union leadership. So they need to understand what is sustainability. We want to drive change on the shop floor. So to me, leadership at all levels is also very, very important part of the way we want to uh, kind of uh, drive the future. 
And just like his boss, Narendra is also an avid runner. He hits the streets every morning for a jog and if he's traveling, he takes to the treadmill to get an hour of what he calls meditative space. Yes, uh, I also run pretty much every day, but uh, Chandra runs four times as much as I do. So he runs a full marathon, I run 10K. So that's a big difference. But yes, it's a very important part of uh, my day, my mornings, uh, that one hour, one and a half hours. If I'm traveling, it's on the treadmill. If I'm not traveling, it's on the road wherever I'm there. So, so I think it's, uh, for me, a great part of my day. It's my personal time. I like to run by myself, uh, uh, you know, and that's my meditative time in some sense. It's my reflection time. Music is a very important part of my life. I listen to all kinds of music. When I turned 40, I learned to play the drums. So I play the drums on weekends when I'm in Jamshedpur. I have a music room uh, with my drums. So that's again uh, time to relax. Uh, did I think I would be the CEO of Tata Steel 30 years back? Certainly not. Right? But you grow into the job. Right? So, so to me, everyone has a potential. And uh, you need to help people realize their potential by uh, sometimes throwing them into the deep end, by talking to them, helping them, giving them feedback. That's also a part of helping them realize their potential because sometimes you don't have the difficult conversations that are important, right? You cannot develop somebody by just having nice conversations with them. So there are a bunch of things that you need to do. And uh, I think uh, uh, if we've developed a whole bunch of leaders uh, like we always have and left Tata Steel much stronger, uh, you know, I tell all my colleagues, you know, in, in these organizations, you're running with the baton, right? It's like a relay race. So somebody gave you the baton, you're running with it. Your job is to make sure that you hand over the baton of an organization which is stronger than what you inherited. Narendran has set Tata Steel on a path to growth, but he's not basking in all the glory just yet. There's a long way to go. There are many parts of Tata Steel who have a lot of work to do. There are many parts of Tata Steel who are doing a wonderful work. So everyone knows and it's not something that if you're excellent today, that it's guaranteed that you'll be excellent forever. Right? So that keeps people on their toes. I think nothing is impossible. I mean, that's the way I look at it. You know, it's just a question of being prepared for it and working on it and uh, we can make things happen. Well, nothing is impossible and that is the story of Tata Steel under TV Narendran and that brings the curtains down on the second episode of The Winning Mindset, The CEO Guidebook. We will see you next time with the story of another trailblazer from the world of business. For now, from all of us here on the team, goodbye and thanks for watching.